think of it like this. There are subject matter experts in every field. And pe- white people consistently think that every black person is a subject matter expert in race, mm-hmm. which is not true. Like I particularly at some point, I don't consider myself a subject matter expert yet, but I will be. And that's why I'm willing to have these conversations. That's why we see people on Instagram who are having these conversations, are putting out this content and the same in corporate spaces and fitness spaces. Like those are the subject matter experts. That's why you can ask them. But if it's, if it's your friend who is just your friend, that, that there is no rite of passage passage per se to just because you're black, just because you're BIPOC, I'm going to ask you this question. At Active Life, we believe that the healthcare clinic of the future is the gym. Everybody starts with the best case scenario in mind. Never sell anything to anybody who is not in the market for what you have. The only reason we work out is to create the opportunity to recover. And the healthcare provider of the future is the coach. And this is why you guys need to get paid well, because what you're doing is really, really hard work. Taryn Pascal, welcome to the Active Life Podcast. Thank you so much. Can I, can I tell you a secret? Yeah. This is the only podcast that I have been even borderline nervous for in, really? since, since like 2017 when I first started. Wow. <laughs> you know, because you, you know why it's, um, when we first spoke, you were so helpful and so forthcoming and so good at, at holding space for the areas where I need to learn more. Mm-hmm. And now we're here talking about it. The things that we're going to talk about publicly for our audience of thousands of listeners to hear. And we're talking about things that are touchy. You know, yeah. th- things that um, you're going to give me what you believe the best answers are and that other people are going to say that's that's the wrong answer and that other people will probably judge me for even asking. Possibly, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's why I feel like we must have this conversation. I 100% agree with you. So I would love to kick it off by just briefly, if you could explain to me where your background comes from as a diversity recruiter you know, you don't just get to be not Caucasian and call yourself a diversity recruiter. So how how does that work? What is that? What is the purpose of even having that job in a business? Yeah, that is a great question. And I would actually disagree because there are a lot, there is actually one Caucasian person on my team. No, no, no. I wasn't saying you can't be Caucasian. I was saying you don't get to show up and be like, Hey, I'm black. So hire me or, Hey, I'm Asian. So, you know, I know about diversity and recruiting. No. Very true. Yeah. So I started my career. Um, I have a hospitality management degree, so I have always loved connecting with people and that really translated into actually helping people. And my way of helping people is, really letting them tell their stories and trying to inspire them and really understanding that you are capable and worthy of being in any space that you occupy. And that of course, for me being a biracial black woman is huge because I grew up in a white, a predominantly white area, which I never even knew like, curly hair was a thing that braids were actually (laughs) attractive, like all of these things. So actually getting into a career, I knew that diversity had always been something that I promoted, but I didn't realize I was doing it until I got into the corporate space and uh, ended up getting this position last November actually November, 2019. So I have been in this space ever since then. And that has now grown, um, to me sharing my stories to, um, not only the corporate space, but also the spaces, the other spaces that I occupy, which are 
fitness, weightlifting, CrossFit, all of that. So, yeah. Is there an education requirement to, to fill the role of diversity recruiter? For this specific role, no. And I don't necessarily think that that is where there is people have different, different like feelings because I don't have a degree in uh, race and equity. Um, but there are people who definitely do have those degrees and they usually become diversity consultants or diversity and inclusion leaders. Um, but you don't, there's an education background that you need in a sense of like, you need to know what white privilege is. You need to know that there is disparities within all uh, spaces that are created in the United States or have been created in the United States and the world. But like as a formal education, not so much. Okay. So I like to say C's get degrees and degrees don't equal careers. So, yes, I like so that. I mean, like, whatever. <laughs> I was just curious if there was like a specialized education somebody can go through. So what I want to, I want to set the framework for everybody for what I, what I intend to hopefully get out of this conversation with you. When I say get, I know it sounds selfish, but I mean for everybody who's going to listen and yeah. what I, we're not going to cover things. I'm not going to ask about things like, um, is white privilege a thing? is, you know, should a transgender now female be allowed to use the male bathroom? Like those are, those are different debates that exist in the plane that, that is worth conversating about. It's just that in this environment, I want to talk to you more about how to create an environment where you're getting the best people and where the people who you get are representative of the people who you want to serve. And how getting that kind of population of people can make your business better because having different ideas from different socioeconomic, racial, gender backgrounds actually improves your message such that you become more and more and more resonant with a larger group of people within your niche. That's, mm -hmm. that's my hope. I, I'm hoping that I can do that. <laughs> I think you'll help. I think you'll help. What I want to do is I want to get to, let's get right into some of the, 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 the number one topic that for me always comes up about how to create a more diverse work environment is at active life. We don't attract many minorities who are either taking our education and therefore are eligible to apply for employment at our company. And we don't market intentionally at white people who can afford us. You know, we, we just put our stuff out there. But we don't seem to get an influx of people from BIPOC communities. Yeah. How, like, what is our responsibility if we choose to take it to create a more inclusive message and, and to just the whole thing, like I can't put out stuff and just be like, Hey, enroll, by the way, you can do, you can enroll if you're black too. Okay. That's not <laughs> the way I want to do it. Yeah. I think, you know, and I think I've had this conversation with a few people too, that in order to create an inclusive space, and to create a space that is for everyone, it's it's going to be it's going to be very specific to the space that you're in. So we're in the fitness space, but active life in the fitness space, I feel like holds its own space in general. So that's what's up. Uh, <laughs> um, so I would say, you know, it could be as easy as adding in marketing. But again, at new marketing, but at the same time, if you don't know what you're looking for, then that could also just be another failure. The, the, I would say one of the biggest things is starting with small efforts and understanding that things you will try, things will fail things you will try, things will succeed. And 
in to be more specific when we talk about things like if you are looking for new people to hire into your organization, where are you looking? Are you looking in the same market? Are you looking in the same um, area? Are you looking for something that everyone at Active Life already has? And that's that could be like, maybe I need to look for somebody who doesn't have the certification that we have, but is just as qualified. Like there are certain ways to go around to be more inclusive that, you know, inclusion is about accessibility. Inclusion is about finding that person that maybe like didn't go to college, but is trying to get to college, but doesn't have that mentor. And that's like the mentorship path is led to actually getting sort of certified and then they become a full-time employee. Like all of these things are in the realm of inclusion. How do we do that without pandering? And, and what I mean by that is this, uh, we've, we have since the beginning of time featured black women, especially, uh, in our marketing, because one of the best coaches who's ever worked for me was a black woman. And mm-hmm. she'll listen to this. So Asia, you know, go ahead, pat yourself on the back, all the good stuff. But, and, and she's, she's, exactly the aesthetic that that people who are looking to work with us are attracted to. She's she's an attractive female who's fit and it just so happens that she's she's black. And if she wasn't, we would probably still use her. You know what I mean? But mm-hmm. our marketing has had that in it and it hasn't turned into black people coming to us. So I'd like you to answer that question first and then I'll get to the second one which is the pandering question. I would say you mention a certain aesthetic that in itself is, is something that could change because I, if I use myself in, as an example, I am a five, nine, uh, biracial <laughs> athlete, but I don't have the typical aesthetic that is used for the fitness space per se. And there are other people who have, obviously, I'm not qualified. <laughs> I don't have all of those degrees or any certifications, all of that. But that's to say that maybe that's what needs to change. Maybe you are looking at an aesthetic that is not, you're not going to be able to find that aesthetic in the BIPOC community. And maybe Asia was an outlier. One, not an outlier, okay. but that's why the BIPOC community is like, Mm, like I get it, but at the same time, I'm just, I'm not there yet. Like, I don't, I can't connect with this person yet because I, I look like her, but I don't look like her. And that, that's like the biggest thing when we think of how the rates of obesity and everything within the BIPOC community is so high. And we think it's so easy. Like companies think it's so easy for them to just, go into the fitness space, like they don't feel comfortable because they don't see people. I mean, now it's better, but two years ago, five years ago, they didn't see people who look like them. And, and that like, that's a disconnection. There, there's no inclusion in that. So maybe it's the aesthetic that. I think, I think what you're speaking to, if my understanding is more diversity within our diversity, like it's, it's yes. great to have Asia prominent in our marketing, it would also be valuable to have four other people. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. So in regards to the, the intern moving up to the, the paid role, you know, getting the certification through the internship, if not through more diverse marketing, mm-hmm. how do we get the intern? Because I'm all for that. And, and, and what I've done in the past and what we do now at Active Life still, just much less prominently because as we're growing, it's becoming less and less, um, some, less, and less controllable. And we're, mm-hmm. we're going to get back to it and prioritize it. We have a program where if you can't afford to pay us to work with us, we take you on as a client in exchange for two hours a week of community service. 
wherever you choose to do it. So that the barrier to entry is not necessarily financial, but effort. And mm -hmm. I've gotten both praise for that and criticism for that. And the praise I've gotten mm -hmm. for it is that's really cool that you would create that opportunity for somebody. And yeah. the criticism I've gotten is that person doesn't need to be um, further beaten down that they need to go and do something above the potential 60 hour work week that they're putting in to not be able to afford to work with you. And I'm just, it's a tough spot for me. And then the other thing is I don't want to assume that black people fall into a category of can't afford it. And it's not just yeah. black, it's Asian, it's Latino, it's, it's, you know, gender fluid people, all of that. It's not about money necessarily. I'm just pointing to the fact that we have an accessible pathway in that we haven't seen people who would lack the financial means to access utilize. Yeah. Um, can you repeat your question? How do you get the intern? <laughs> How do you get the intern? Like, like I, um, I don't want to walk into the, pardon me if this is an, an inconsiderate thing to say. I don't want to walk into the MLK center in my town and say, anybody want to intern? Yeah, that, <laughs> that would not be <laughs> a good idea. Um, I think, this is this is where it gets tricky and this is where it really becomes a a strategy like you can't like you said you can't go to the MLK center you can't just say in your marketing we're looking for black people like that is not going to bid well for anyone um but it's it's you can I always like to make the connection of affirmative action. Like there are people who do appreciate affirmative action in the sense of uh, in colleges and institutions being able to utilize the fact that, you know, we, and I, when I say we, I'm talking about black people. Um, I should say I for myself in particular um, do really appreciate affirmative action because that does, that would give me the opportunity to join active life. Um, and let me better explain this affirmative action in the case of marketing for a new intern would be, we at active life are an inclusive and we, we're an inclusive company we are looking to hire more, a more diverse workforce. With that being said, we are looking for people who are in those, like those terms that follow who are, are very, have to be very specific. They have to be looked over. I always say it's better to include somebody from legal to make sure that it makes sense. And that is, like I could, I could tell you what you could write, but I also don't want to tell you because at the same time, like it still could be. Yeah, I follow you. It, you know, what, why is that such a sticky topic? And, and what I mean by that is, if I'm, if my intent, the intent is there. You know, I'm, it, it's, I'm trying, if I'm trying to do the thing to create the diversity amongst our team, both mm -hmm. within our staff and within the people who are taking our education. And I use the wrong words to get it out. Why is there judgment for using the wrong words to try to do the right thing? Instead of, I'm not saying from you, instead of support to say, I understand what you're trying to do there. Maybe let's say it this way instead. And then it doesn't become such a big barrier for a company to say, hey, we're looking to, if I was to put that out, my language would be, we are looking to expand our team. And we want to grow our team by finding the best people. And we believe that the best people exist in multiple different cultural backgrounds, race backgrounds, gender backgrounds. And we are looking for people of all different race, gender, and cultural backgrounds to join our team. If you feel like you would be a good fit for the team, please apply here. And like, I would say something like that. And it wouldn't be right. And that's okay. But I believe that there needs to be acceptance for intent and then improvement. 
Otherwise the barrier just becomes, why am I doing this? Like why does it have to be so hard to tell somebody I want them to come and work here? Yeah. And it's, uh, that is a good question. And I, I believe that as a black, as the black community, the BIPOC community, like we, there are some people that will appreciate that effort because they feel seen. They're finally like, okay, this, like you do, you like, I am a part of this. You do want me to join this company and all of that. But there are also people who for whatever reason, and their reasons are always valid. They just don't agree with it because I, I would say, because they don't, it shouldn't have to be said that we are looking for people of different races, mm-hmm. uh, genders, all of that. I agree. And, and I, that's where it's like, but I'm right. trying, like, I, that's where it's, it's difficult. And that's where like, there are going to be people who agree with you and then there are going to be people who won't agree with you. But I think overall, the people that are agreeing with you, those are the people that you are wanting to attract in the first place. A hundred percent. And the people and, who, would, who would judge us for it, I'm like, look, we're the wrong place for you. The, exactly. The, the, the part of me that second guesses that is the part of me that says the reason we're looking to hire this, this demographic of population and not one, but the specifically non-specific is because we don't know how to say that message properly. You know, and it's like, well, we don't have enough influence within our company to put that out in a way that has people saying that's the right message. And so would I be making a mistake to just say, well, look, if you don't fit what we're trying to say here, you're not going to be a fit here because the point is trying to expand what a fit here looks like. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't think I, on a personal level, wouldn't like if it's, this is the same thing that I tell people that come to my Instagram page or that I am working with as a client with, with diversity recruiting like you sometimes you're just not going to, you're not going to fit. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing. You're never going to be able to please everyone. And in, I think your overall message of I'm trying to make this a more diverse and inclusive space was productive and seen, but them in particular, like that person is just not gonna like they they will see that message but at the same time they're like well this is just not for me which is not a bad thing right because you know yeah yeah, i I follow i mean it's i think if i made a message like the one i just described it'd be difficult to say he's insensitive he's misogynist he's white power (laughs) like i think it'd be difficult to say that but i i you know look this is one of the topics that i i think is important because i really don't understand it well enough Mm -hmm. to stand on a, on a stage and talk about it. And I participate in an industry that I think is especially in need of improving their ability to, to be an inclusive space. You know, every, everything from bro culture in the gym that (laughs) repels a white woman, you know, to, um, just the lack of representation from a variety of different populations. And I've been making some content recently around uh, diversity of body type as Mm -hmm. coaches in the gym. The idea that you're not looking for some, like what does fit look like? If that person all of a sudden gains 15 pounds, are they no longer fit to work in your gym? Like where's, Mm -hmm. so, so we'll put that aside and put it in a little bucket. (laughs) (laughs) Um, The pandering thing. I mm-hmm. want I want to make sure that we avoid doing that, and and that um, it's never it's never seen as that because to me, the truth is the reason why I would want people from BIPOC communities to come and work at Active Life and to take our coursework at Active Life is selfish. I want to make our company better. I want to make mm-hmm. our material better, and I believe that that's a good way to do it. Uh, the the thing I want to avoid is speaking on things that I don't have real clarity around 
just mm-hmm. so that I can be supportive of a community. And, and I'll use um, the events of the summer as, as an example for you to kind of help me out with this, if you will. Mm-hmm. Do you put up a black square? Do you not put up a black square? Is it enough to put up a black square? Is it not enough? If I don't put it up and I say something, but I say the wrong thing, is that worse than not saying anything at all? And all of those things start to go through my head because if I do the wrong thing in that moment in an effort to demonstrate support for a movement, I could sabotage our company and make it more difficult for everybody who works here and enjoys what we do to enjoy what we do. Yeah. How do you tell the line? See, and this is where, this is a topic that is where being genuine and authentic is and and listening to, listening to, I would say your voice, but listening to your heart. Like if you, nobody, I initially thought in the beginning that it would be good to do the black square, but then I read the message that was behind it and realized that that was not the right thing to go to do because that was just not amplifying the voices that should have been amplified. So in any situation like that, it's the first thing is remembering that it's not about you in that moment. It's about, it's about somebody else. It's about others and remembering that, okay, if this is not truly about me, then how would I want to make somebody feel? If this is, if, if I'm posting something or if I'm making a statement somewhere, I'm envisioning talking to my dad. I'm envisioning talking to my best friend, like all of these things that I know I can come down to a somewhat calm or relaxed state of like, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to show you that I support you. I'm trying to show you that I probably won't get everything right. And I probably won't, it will take me time. And maybe this is the first time I've ever thought about this, whatever it may be, but be honest, be authentic and be genuine because there were, there's so many people now that I know have, were just pandering and we're just being performative but I still am in connection with a lot of people who are making those efforts. And in the beginning, did they necessarily do the right thing? Not really, but they didn't do the wrong thing, which is being inauthentic and dishonest and obviously being performative and all of that. Because I think as a human, human to human, we can see the difference when somebody is social media makes it a little tricky but human to human, we can see, we can feel that difference of support and gen- genuine, genu- genuinity. I don't know how to say that word. <laughs> I mean, I, I can tell you this much. I can tell you that I, I made a statement at the time. There was, first of all, we, the speed with which everything happened made things way more difficult to be Mm -hmm. introspective about it before making a decision and things like putting the black squares up. I found out at like noon, Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, shit, like, uh, (laughs) do we do it? And I called some people and they're like, you should do it. I'm like, okay, I'm going to do it. But I don't really know why I'm like, I'm just going to do it because I was told I should do it by people who I respect. I made a personal statement where I actually put my face on the camera. I talked about my thoughts, my feelings and all of that Mm -hmm. stuff about it. Um, Within two months, I would have amended my personal statement. You know, not, not, not because I wasn't sympathetic with the cause. I absolutely am. Because I learned things that, that mm-hmm. would have made my statement better. And I've gone back and forth on do I take something like that down or not because it doesn't represent what I thought. But it, it does represent what I thought in the moment that I created it, so I leave it. That's exactly – I'm shaking my head because – that for me is growth. Like you can, that is the talking point for somebody who you're trying to explain. Like I didn't know in the beginning, Mm -hmm. I still said something. I still was honest with everybody, but look at where I started. Like there's no reason why anyone can't do what I just did because I, and I leave this up here because again, like that's authenticity. Mm -hmm. Like you aren't, you weren't afraid or 
maybe you were afraid. I, I was don't know. not comfortable. <laughs> not comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> but you took that time to put that up there. And now that's like, that's like progress. That's like, I PR'd my ability to understand diversity. Mm-hmm. So I'm, and I'm going to keep doing it because that's exactly what you're supposed to do as a human being. Right. Right. So, well, I appreciate that. And I, I will say I saw some stuff on social media and I was like, eh, that's bullshit. You're, you don't <laughs> believe that. That's not true. You're a liar. I can see it, but that's, that's fine. That's fine. I'm glad you said something. Um, kind of, <laughs> it's one of the most difficult things that I have found, um, throughout this whole process of really, uh, I'm not happy that stuff went down this summer the way that it did. Uh, selfishly, I am grateful for the opportunity to open up a blind spot that mm-hmm. I, I didn't know I had. One of the most difficult things about navigating it has been that I grew up with mostly white friends. Mm-hmm. I went to college and had mostly white friends. I met my wife who, when you go through her yearbook, I like to joke around. If you grab the book and you just flip the pages, like let them go, you'd be like, there she is. Cause she was not like me. She grew up with a lot of African American, black Islander American friends, um, in a very different kind of neighborhood than I grew up in. And so her friends became my friends and I got the opportunity to make meaningful relationships with people who have very different experiences in their lives than I did starting in college, (laughs) which I feel blessed for. I was able to go to many of them and ask them questions during this time. Uh, After having invested a decade and a half in, forgive my language, giving a shit about them, you know, (laughs) before I asked, hey, I don't understand this. Would you educate me on it a little bit? But I know a lot of people who don't have that base. Mm -hmm. And I found myself answering questions to the best that I could to my my white friends that I had been taught by my BIPOC friends Mm -hmm. who I was like, I don't even know if I'm answering the question the right way. And I'm going back and asking another question. Why is it so... um, I'm trying to think of the best way to ask you, why can't white people ask black people questions about how to do this stuff. Like that, that's, that's the, the question I was dancing around, whatever. That's the question. <laughs> Just get it out. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a very, I would say it's a very personal topic because it is, it's literally traumatic to be asked as, as a black woman, it is traumatic it's a, it's a traumatic experience when people ask you, well, like why, why ask you about police and, and anything in the sense of race, because majority of it is related to black people. Um, so I think that is like the short answer of that. And I would say the long answer which is not very long. It's just, it's, it's personal for people. Like there, there are people think of it like this. There are subject matter experts in every field and white people consistently think that every black person is a subject matter expert in race, Mm -hmm. which is not true. Like I particularly at some point, I don't consider myself a subject matter expert yet but I will be. And that's why I'm willing to have these conversations. That's why we see people on Instagram who are having these conversations are putting out this content and the same in corporate spaces and fitness spaces. Like those are the subject matter experts. That's why you can ask them. But if it's, if it's your friend who is just your friend, that, that there is no rite of passage passage per se to just because you're black, just because you're BIPOC, I'm going to ask you this question. Like it's just, but is it, is it, is it bad to be able to say, Hey, why does this make you feel that way? How, how else are people supposed to learn? Otherwise they're looking at like they're, they're on Instagram 
and they're seeing people who are saying what they believe, but there's no connection there. Right. And then when they ask the person who's speaking on it, it's like, you need to go learn. Well, I'm trying to learn. That's why I'm here. You made a statement. I'm asking you a question about your statement. You're telling me to go learn. Where the fuck am I supposed to do that? <laughs> there are a lot of resources that people, people, that response is, well, you're supposed to learn. That is a response because they're, they don't, again, trauma is intertwined in these questions. So they, again, and also as a black person, we shouldn't have to, again, I'm a subject matter expert, but as a black person, BIPOC person, like you, some, some people, I grew up in a white neighborhood. So at some point I didn't even know what white privilege was and any of that. So how would I be able to answer that question either? Like I need to do that research also. And that research is reading books and reading articles. And if you actually want personal experience, then that's where having difficult conversations like, like, like that are very touchy. And it's, some people will be like, yep, I I'm happy to have it. And some people are like, this is not something that I want to talk about. And that's where like, you have to learn, learn how people are, who people are and understand that there are boundaries to this and that there, there are millions of resources that are not from an actual person's mouth per se. Right. Actively live speaking to you. Yeah. (laughs) So, so Taryn, just a genuine curiosity question. Do you get pushback from the black community because you grew up in a white neighborhood where, where there's this thought of like, you don't, you don't even fully understand it. You can't be speaking to people about it. That, I mean, I haven't, I would say I received that more growing up because I grew up in a white community and my mom is white and I would go to, I only really, we were like one of six families in our neighborhood outside of those, outside of our little city, there were more, uh, there's way more diversity. Um, so when we go to those, uh, cities for basketball games, baseball, all of that, then I never felt comfortable because I never felt like I, like the first time I ever saw a black person, it didn't really hit me like in that moment, but I think back to it and I'm like, I was like so uncomfortable trying to figure out what, like there are other people that look like me, but like, I still do. I, I don't look like them like exactly. Mm -hmm. And I know that my mom is white and I, I know that they are darker than me. Does that make me, like, what does that make me? And that's like something that I've had to learn and accept throughout my 25 years of life because I am black and I choose to identify as black because when you see me on the street, yeah, you, you look black, <laughs> I look black. Yeah. <laughs> so I wouldn't say I'm actually surprised that I haven't gotten any, as I've started being more active on social media and everything, but I also am very conscious of recognizing and acknowledging the privileges that I have because I do have so many more that uh, full black people don't necessarily have. Mm -hmm. So I think that's also why, but it's, it's, it's a daily, it's a daily challenge for sure. I just just think it's such a, um, such an interesting spot to be, you know, it's, (laughs) it's, it's the idea of, um, I was curious if there's a purity test, if you will. Definitely. Definitely. It's, I would say it's more internally sometimes than it is externally, but like I question, I question myself, like, can I even post this? Mm -hmm. Can I like just saying that I identify as a black woman for the first time was like, right. I don't know how this is going to be received. Well, we, we have, um, it's different. It's mm-hmm. similar and different in the Jewish community. Oh, yeah. You know, if, if you're, if you're talking about a, a Hasidic Jew, for example, I'm not even Jewish. Like, forget about it. I'm, 
I'm not even in the class. <laughs> Orthodox Jewish people, it's it's and I'm of course I'm generalizing, but when you're looking at an Orthodox Jewish person, it's like I get that you're trying and we think that's really sweet and cute, but you're not really practicing Judaism. And it just keeps on going down and down and down in, in the devout level. Um and it's just it's interesting. Like the 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 purity test to me there is interesting. And and yeah. of course the the biggest difference for someone walking around town like me who, who identifies Jewish from a religion perspective is, uh, you can't guess that when you see yeah. me, you're not like, Oh, that guy's Jewish. No, you're like, Oh, it, that's, that's a white dude. <laughs> right. Yeah. So the next thing I wanted to get to was, are you familiar with the Rooney rule in the NFL? It's no. basically the NFL's <laughs> affirmative action, uh, for coaching. And the, the rule oh, is, or in front office, in order to hire somebody, you must interview a minority candidate. And I'm, I'm curious if I see both sides of it, right? Like they don't make the team try out a white running back before they pick the running back. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a, I don't know, 31 to one ratio of black running backs to white running backs who are starting for teams in the NFL. I don't think yeah. that's, I don't think that's a racist thing. I don't think they're like, Oh yeah, let's hold the white guy down. Don't give him the rock. But, you follow what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. in the front office, it's you must interview a minority. I go back and forth because I feel like um, you will be exposed to people who you otherwise never would have had the opportunity to expose yourself to. And the NFL has enough pull that you're not going to have a problem finding somebody to interview for that job uh, of any color or background. At the same time, would I want to, like, if it was a Jewish thing, like, you must interview one Jewish candidate. Do I want to be the Jewish candidate who's like, I know I'm here as a formality, like, you got your guy already. Is that pandering? That, I at first, I've never heard of that rule, but I don't know that much about the NFL. So, I, yeah, I would, I would consider that pandering okay. because that, that's where people, people like to think that that is also reverse racism. Yeah. By saying, which is, a, is another, is there's, 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 def, there's a definition but, issue there, but I, I follow. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I wouldn't want to be knowing that I, that would probably deter me from wanting to be in the NFL. If that was ever a goal of mine. Right. But yeah, I don't. I was hmm. just curious. <laughs> you know, I, I think the other mistake that, um, that I want to try to avoid is, Hiring somebody of color or of gender um, diversity or religion or anything, and then explaining to the team, meet our new staff member. Oh, what made you decide to hire them? They were pretty qualified and they were black and were low on black people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so, like, it's, it's just, it's hard. I don't know how to like if, if, if so let me, let me, let me give you a two in a different way. When we hire coaches for our team, for example, we want them to not only have been through our education because they've gone through education and they know it, but because it means that they identified our education as something that they believe is important and valuable and therefore invested their time, their money and their energy into gaining it as opposed to somebody who is looking for a job. Yeah. And it's really hard for me to detach myself from that and say, well, we need to bring in more diversity because I think that we should. Not to suggest, by the way, we're not, on a, you know, look at the roster white. <laughs> like, but, um, but it's not far from that. And so I just, I don't know how to get that thing started. Like I don't, I feel like we're two or three years away from having critical mass of people having been through our education because of our inclusive marketing outreach who then qualify for internship or entry level job who then climb our ladder. Mm -hmm. The only exception to that is we just, we just did interviews for our sales team and I did have the, the pleasure of interviewing um, a few people who were of black origin in fact, I offered one of them the job and she turned it down. I thought she was the best candidate that we got. Um, um. But what are you going to do? <laughs> uh, so like, 
how do I speed that up? It's, I don't want it to take two or three years. And I also don't want to bring somebody in who's less than qualified, but has potential, but never went through our education because they didn't find it to be important. That is the biggest thing. People want a diversity strategy that's going to be expedited. And that's, it's not going to be possible, especially if it's the first time it's ever been brought up. So would we be and, better? I'm sorry, I, I cut you off. I shouldn't have. No, you're fine. Um, I, and, and like, in reference, if we are thinking about corporations and organizations, you can't, you will never, like, that growth that you are looking for shouldn't be immediate because that that is then where pandering Right. And that's how it feels. performative, yeah, that and perf- uh, performative uh, actions yeah. actually. People, people don't think we're doing such a good job. We're making less money, but we do have some black people on staff. Like that's it, exactly. that's, that's not where I want to go with it. So I would say, be and that's that's the thing. You have to be in it for the long haul in order to see progress and understand. And that's why, and that's why I tell people like you're going to fail at things. Your marketing strategy the first time, it's probably not going to work. It may work or like your ROI on that is not going to be as much as you expected, but that doesn't mean that you stop. And that doesn't mean that the next time it's not going to get higher. Mm -hmm. It just means that this is the first time you're doing it. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like I think that so many people and organizations, corporations, they want things to be done. Boom, 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 boom. And it's just not going to happen like that. It's not, it's not about, it's not like making a few extra dollars. It's, it's literally being a human being. So it, it sounds like we might be better served in the short term, almost creating an advisory board, if you will, of, of people who don't, function in our business, but who can observe our business and provide feedback and guidance for how we can create a more inclusive environment within it. I a hundred percent agree with that. Yeah. That's a really productive step for me to be able to take. I appreciate that. (laughs) Of course. Uh, I had something I wanted to ask you and it just disappeared from my head, which is a good sign. It means I'm listening. It's also, (laughs) it's also a problem because I really wanted to ask it. Uh, oh man, I don't remember what it was. Anyway, as we move forward into this whole idea of trying to become um, more inclusive, there mm-hmm. are two mistakes that I am af- afraid to make. Okay. The first one would be for people who are listening to this to just start outreach, if you will, to communities mm-hmm. in which you don't have clientele from. And then creating more of a uh, tossed salad than a melting pot, right? Where it's like yes. you have your lettuce over here, you have your tomatoes in between them, but like they're not mixing, you know? And, that's, and that dressing, you know. Yes, forget spot. about it. The dressing <laughs> covers everybody and no one likes it. So it's, it's how do you avoid that would be the first question. And then the second question, I'm going to say it out loud just so that I don't forget the second question. Again, I just forgot it. I'm going to think about it. Damn it. Go. Please answer the first one. Um, and I just forgot your first question. Uh, I remember I'm- the second one. <laughs> <laughs> the, the first question was, how do you, how do you avoid uh, creating the, the, sal- the, mix, the mixed salad instead of the melting pot as you start to bring diversity into your organization? Oh, Whether that's um, a staff or his clientele. I would say, like you mentioned, the council, I'd also just, I was also just thinking about why not find some stakeholders, some gyms that can, some gyms, companies, whatever it may be, that would be more, most effective that do already have a diverse member base. Well, so, so I, w- I love that. And I just, just cause I know you're up against the clock. I want to make sure I ask you the follow up question to that. I want to sell it to them. 
because I don't want to be like, hey, we want to gain influence in black communities in the case that I'm thinking of right now, which is your friend who you connected me to to help us make our story more inclusive when we tell it at our seminar. I want to sell her our service because I believe that her gym would be better if she bought it. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't want to go there and be like, hey, I want to expand our diversity. And in doing so, I also want to make your gym better. You should buy our program. That, that just comes across disingenuous. The reality is I think every gym should buy our program. It just so happens I'm now talking to somebody with the expressed intent of expanding our diversity. I would say, I mean, I think, I don't think going into that conversation with the idea that like, like of not mentioning diversity would be a bad thing, but I do also go back to that feeling of, are you creating a partnership because it's for you? Or are you creating it's a partnership because it's for others? For others. Like, but, but I, I like the way I feel about our sales is that it's not for us. You know, we, we don't sell anything to anybody for us. We sell it to other people because we believe that the fitness industry will be better if other people take this education and their lives and their gyms and their clients' lives will be better if they allow us to educate them. Then, I don't know. I would have to think about that because I can see why that would be problematic. Like I see why mm -hmm. I, I hear it and I feel like it's not genuine, but I know the oh, intent genuine. of, I, I, <laughs> I know. I, the I, I promise you I could, life. I could shut down this company <laughs> and do other things and make a million dollars a year personally. and never have to worry about my own money, my own family, any of that. Instead, I'm pursuing this crazy thing that is extremely difficult, stressful oftentimes. Um, because I think it's necessary. Yeah. So it's not about like our, it's in our core values. It's not about you and it's always your fault. Then I, I would say lead, lead with that. Then lead with what you lead with what you know. And instead of leading with this message that I want to make your gym better and I'm doing this because you have a diverse member base and lead with, I just want to make lead with what? No, you're right. Yeah. I, as I'm thinking about it, you're right. It's, it's just, <laughs> it's, it, it just so happens that I got connected to her by you because of what I was looking to do. Okay. So last question. And I know that you got a hard stop. Um, <laughs> the first person who looks different than everybody else joins the team. Mm -hmm. How do you make the environment suitable for them to influence the team without changing the direction of the team? I would say I think of like the best way, like on somebody's first day of work. Just in general, like, 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 if, like if I hired you to be a coach mm -hmm. on our staff, um, my initial thought would be don't do anything. She's just, she's another coach on our staff and, and her influence will rub off on other people when we demonstrate that it's a safe place to speak your mind. That's my, yeah. that's my thought. I just want to make sure that that's the right way to I, go about it. I wouldn't say don't do, don't not do anything. Cause I think that there's, you still need to do something because initially like if I'm thinking of me walking into a space that is all white, I'm not going to be my whole self mm -hmm. because I don't feel comfortable being my whole self. And so that's when like, there are things that you need to do to make, make people more comfortable. And like that what? whole, like what, what can you, can you give me one or two tangible examples? Because I know what it's not. And I can't think of what it is. I would say starting the first day by saying that, all of our voices are important and like we what like you mentioned having a safe space like say that make sure these things are said and known and once it'll still take a little time for somebody or maybe it won't i would say speaking for myself it would take a little time but i think initially hearing that like 
I, my voice is important too. Like mm-hmm. I'm, I'm here because I deserve to be here, but I also, my voice is also important also, and will be heard. Mm-hmm. Like that is very powerful and very inclusive in this. If it actually, of course you can always say things, but if you actually do them, the action base behind that is. Yeah. I think anybody on our well. team would speak to the fact that we, we do what we say and we live yeah. what we say. Um, Okay. I think, yeah, I do believe that our corporate culture is such that somebody would walk in and understand that. And and I do think that we can put process to making sure that that happens every time, no matter who gets hired. Um, and then it's just the thing that we do that goes across all things. Uh, one rapid fire question for you, because I promised someone I would ask it. What is, (laughs) is, is there an industry right now that has more opportunity than others for more diversity inclusion? I would say, Your internet cut out for a second there, but you would say what? Oh, I would say, can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, I would say the fitness space. Because we're talking about it. Yeah. <laughs> Term. They're, and they're all, I will say, I will end with this. Every space needs more. There will never be enough. Taryn, where can people find you? Uh, Instagram, Taryn, T underscore T E E underscore smiles with three S's at the end <laughs> and, <laughs> and LinkedIn, a Taryn Pascal. We'll put it in the show notes. All right. Taryn, it was, it was, it was uh, so great to be able to have this conversation with you. So refreshing and I believe so valuable. And I appreciate you making the time and the space for me to do it. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this episode of the active life podcast. If you did, please be sure to head to wherever you listened to it and give us a quality review as well as five stars if you can spare them. If you want more from us, feel free to follow all of our social media accounts at Active Life Professional, Active Life Rx, and Dr. Sean Pastuch on Instagram. Remember, at Active Life, we believe that the healthcare clinic of the future is the gym and the healthcare provider of the future is the coach. We also believe that that future is now. Time to